doing so, for making the time, taking the time to remember. Now, with the current war in the Ukraine and many other conflicts around our globe today, remembering and acknowledging our past has never been more vital than it is. Remembering so that we hopefully heed the lessons of war. Remembering so that we hopefully don't go there again. Remembering so that we can continue to care for the needs of others. Remembering so that we seek to reconcile, so that we seek to be united. The Memorial Chapel at St Andrew's College stood on this site and was built in memory of those who lost their lives to those who served their country at great cost. And while we're unable to gather in that particular chapel, today we remember, uh, remember those who passed, those loved ones we lost in our centennial chapel. A chapel that continues to honour our past, but also takes us into the future. And our prayer is that it's a future that is peaceful, that is harmonious, that is caring, a future that I hope our young people see as hopeful. Today we acknowledge the families of those who have lost loved ones in their service to war, to those who have lost loved ones in their service to their country at home, to those who have had loved ones serve and return and yet have had to live with the sacrifices that war brings upon them. Today we also acknowledge those that continue to serve in advisory roles in other war-torn environments and peacekeeping roles around our globe today. Today we remember and share our gratitude for what we enjoy today because of those who have sacrificed so much. We will remember. Let us draw near to God in our call to worship. Let us pray. Dear God, we lift our eyes to the hills and where does our help come from? Our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. God has showed us what is good and what does God require of us? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before our God. Lord, we pray for those in our world today that continue to suffer under the evils of war, for those who live without hope. This prayer we make particularly for those involved in the Ukraine conflict. May your peace and your love somehow surround these people. Please give us the strength, despite our circumstances and our past sufferings, to live in a place where we act justly, are merciful, and show humility. Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. Our first reading this morning will be read by our head boy, Harry Withers, and this will be followed by our first hymn, Praise My Soul, which will be led by Rachel Holyoke. Please stand. Oh, sorry, just wait for the prayer and, and uh, reading, and then we will sing. Thank you, Harry. The reading today comes from Isaiah, chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, the mountain of the Lord. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last two days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many people will come and say, come, come. Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many people. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation nor will they train for war anymore. Here in Sereti.
chapter 21, verses 1 to 4, chapter 22, verses 1 to 5. The New Jerusalem. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down the centre of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, with a fresh crop each month. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. No longer will there be a curse upon anything, for the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there, and his servants will worship him. And they will see his face, and his name will be written on their foreheads. And there will be no night there, no need for lamps or sun, for the Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign for ever and ever. Here ends the reading. We're now going to hear from Nina Fanini, who is going to sing. Uh, Danny Boy, accompanied by uh, Mr. Brian Body. Thank you.
Thank you, Noah. Thank you, Mr. Bonnie. A lovely addition uh, to this very special service. We're going to hear from uh, our rector, Mrs. Christine Layton, and in this address she uh, mentions Mr. Colin Watson, an old call from 1940. Uh, he was to be a special guest with us today and unfortunately has uh, uh, informed us that he couldn't be here, and so he sends his apologies. Our rector. No mai, haida mai, tēnā koutou katoa. I'm sorry not to be able to be with you in person in the St Andrews College Centennial Chapel this Anzac Day, but I know a number of you have gathered together on this important day of remembrance. Since the Memorial Chapel opened on this site in 1955, old collegians and staff who died while serving their country have been remembered at this special Anzac service. This Centennial Chapel, opened in October 2016, has retained the sentiment of the Memorial Chapel in the Memorial Enclave, which houses the original stained glass windows, the Book of Remembrance and Memorial plaques. The name of each serviceman who lost his life in service to his country is read at our weekly chapel service. I am honoured and proud that St Andrews College continues to remember those who paid the ultimate price to ensure a better future for those who came after them. I am grateful that our young people are growing up in a world where selflessness and service continues to be honoured and understood. Since World War II, each generation has adapted their perspective as world politics and global priorities are moulded according to events, new technologies and new threats to our environment. In an increasingly connected world, our priorities over the last three years have been considerably altered since the global pandemic became our new reality. Our young people today are faced with new restrictions and uncertainties. As we navigate these together, I am proud of how our students have responded. I know they will assume responsibility and leadership for making the right decisions in overcoming the challenges confronting their generation. We continue to be inspired by the stories of those who have gone before us. As I wrote this message on Wednesday the 30th of March, I was aware that one of our old collegians, Colin Watson, a boarder at St Andrews College from 1937 to 1940, was celebrating his 100th birthday. I am pleased Colin is with you today at this special service. Welcome to you, Colin and to your family. Colin has vivid memories of his time at St Andrews and recalls it was fairly tough boarding an old Rutherford house. We had to have a cold bath every morning in the winter. They had to put the water in the baths the night before as the pipes would often freeze and there would be no water in the morning. Colin remembers the boys at St Andrews all decked out for territorial training and rifle drills. He later joined the RNZAF and got his flight wings during training in Canada, but missed out on active service during World War II due to his age. Colin's son, Richard Watson, Old Collegian, 1971, grandson, Henry Watson, 2009, son-in-law, Bruce Nell, 1967, grandson James Nell, 1995, and great-grandson Henry Nell, presently in year nine, have all attended St Andrews College. Colin marvels at the opportunities available to Henry today. School life in 2022 seems a stark contrast to the school days he remembers. However, I know today's students continue to be inspired by those who came before. The hardships they endured 
and the challenges they overcame are important lessons as we face our own hurdles in life. Thank you, Colin, to you and all our old collegians who share your stories and we continue to honour those whose lives were cut short through the tragedy of war. Another notable feature of this ANZAC service is the Jeep parked outside the chapel this morning. The Jeep was given to New Zealand by the US in 1942 as part of a Lend-Lease shipment of military equipment. It served in the Pacific and was sold in 1952 by the military to a farmer who kept it in the family for 70 years. Old collegian Gideon Cooper then bought the Jeep and fully restored it, painting it up as a New Zealand Jeep that served in the African and Italian theatre. The Jeep was driven by Gideon's grandfather when he served in the 22nd Battalion. I know many of you in the chapel today, the 107th Anzac Day, are here to remember your own loved ones and family members. Thank you to teachers and families who keep histories and stories alive for young people, who grow up in their own world, but who must continue to learn from the past. For our world to be a place of hope and promise, the stories must continue to be told, lest we forget. Uh, now it gives me great pleasure uh, in inviting Deputy Head Boy Thomas Carmo to come and give you a Year 13 perspective uh, in uh, how he sees ANZAC in 2022. Thomas has come about this privilege by being a top history student. He's come about this by uh, submitting uh, a proposal among other top history students and having his uh, outline and address uh, selected as the one that would be uh, for this occasion. Thomas, thank you for the work you've put into this and we look forward to hearing uh, from you. Thank you, Thomas. There we go. 
World War I and World War II were two of the most infamous events in human history. Between the two wars, there were over 125 million casualties. New Zealand was involved in both and suffered some 70,000 casualties, a significant number for a country which only had a population of 1.7 million. However, these statistics don't seem to achieve what they once did. World War I concluded some 104 years ago, and World War II nearly 80, and so the deaths and the injuries of people from so far in our past can seem less relevant for those of us in the 21st century. So why do we even celebrate Anzac Day? I've heard this question asked so many times, especially by people of my generation. Anzac Day can be dismissed as irrelevant. The wars are old in the past, not as important to our society. A lot of our grandparents and even our great-grandparents were born after World War II, so we have no connection to it. World War II no longer has the importance and relevance that it once did. There seems to be an endless list of reasons that people can give for why Anzac Day is unnecessary or unimportant. But I disagree with all of them. Anzac Day is just as relevant as ever, and I think it's a big misunderstanding to say that Anzac Day is just the World War Day. Today, Anzac Day remembers all of our soldiers and what they've given. World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Malaya, Borneo, the Gulf War, the Middle East, and more. And this doesn't mean glorifying war. It means being grateful and respectful of the sacrifices that those brave people took that gave us our today. And Anzac Day is also about one other key thing that I feel can sometimes be overlooked, the lessons that we can take from it in the Anzac spirit. The Anzac spirit is often talked about and considered to be the reason that the Anzacs were such good soldiers in the wars. The spirit is usually described as the following traits, endurance, courage, ingenuity, good humor, good heartedness, mateship, and camaraderie, regardless of nationality, class, or authority. Now, although these traits are said to be what made the Anzacs good soldiers, I believe that they are the traits that make us good people. It is for this very reason that I believe that with each passing year, Anzac Day has more and more relevance and more and more to teach us. So what can it teach us? Well, firstly, I want to touch on two of the largest names in Kiwi military history. Charles Upham and Willie Apiata. Both demonstrated the traits of the Anzac spirit, hence why they both received the Victoria Cross. For any of those unfamiliar with the Victoria Cross, it is the highest military award available to soldiers in Commonwealth nations and takes a show of immense courage and ability to earn. This is why Upham and Apiata are considered two of New Zealand's greatest soldiers. But the spirit and the traits that earned them the Victoria Cross did not only make them good soldiers, it also made them good people. Sir Charles Upham, famously remembered as one of only three people to ever receive the Victoria Cross twice, demonstrated the Anzac spirit with tenacity. Receiving his first Victoria Cross for his actions in Crete, he is cited as having shown outstanding leadership, tactical skill, and utter indifference to danger. On top of this, he demonstrated the Anzac spirit traits of endurance, courage, and mateship in the way that he led his platoon through seemingly impossible odds. He received his second Victoria Cross after being wounded twice, once from running through open enemy fire and once from single-handedly destroying a German troop truck and continuing to fight on in the Egypt campaign. So there is now no doubting that Upham demonstrated the Anzac spirit to an extraordinary degree in his military life. But what about his personal life? Well, firstly, £10,000 were raised for him upon his return to Christchurch for him to buy a farm. But because of his good heartedness, his mateship and his camaraderie, he elected to instead donate all this money to help educated children of veterans who couldn't afford education. To give you an idea of his generosity, of just how big a deal this is, that is equivalent to nearly one million New Zealand dollars in today's money, which he donated to those in more need. He is also remembered for how difficult it was for him to award any medals, often crediting others he deemed to be more worthy. It took a letter directly from King George himself to convince Upham to accept his second Victoria Cross, again demonstrating the camaraderie he showed. 
Therefore, Upham should be remembered as a generous and humble man because of the way that he let the attributes of the Anzac spirit guide his day-to-day life, showing us all the ways in which the Anzac spirit can help others. Willie Apiata is a more recent example, having received his Victoria Cross in 2007. He received his Victoria Cross for carrying a wounded comrade through 70 metres of broken, rocky and fire-swept ground, fully exposed to the glare of battle. Apiata, like Upham, showed courage, endurance, mateship and camaraderie, disregarding his own life in order to save another. And he, like Upham, continued this into his personal life. After his 23 years of military service, Apiata left to help the High Wire Trust Foundation establish themselves in the Papakura area. The trust opened an outdoor adventure park aimed at helping vulnerable kids and families with accommodation for those in need on site as well. In 2018, he, along with mental health advocate Mike King, organised the very successful I Am Hope tour. His good-heartedness, his mateship and his camaraderie to all allows him to leave a legacy of more than just as a good soldier, but as a good and generous person. Now, of course, there are countless other examples I could give you of those Anzacs who let the Anzac spirit help them in their lives. Gladys Sanford, the legendary Kiwi who organised countless ambulances to help frontliners in Gaza and France during World War I. Moana Nui Akiwa Narimu, the first Māori man to receive the Victoria Cross, who dedicated hours to helping at-risk youths find their passion in rugby, who sadly perished in World War II after saving hundreds from Nazi attacks. But instead of those countless heroes on offer, I want to introduce you to somebody with whom I can relate to a bit more. Recently, my great-aunt Margaret did some research and found a relative of mine who served with the Anzacs in World War I. Henry Bradley was my great-great-grandfather, and as a family, we didn't know much about him. However, a selection of letters and photos we've recovered have helped me and my family to become more acquainted with him. Henry served in the 34th Australian Infantry Battalion as part of the 2nd Anzac Corps in France and Belgium. His battalion led the assault at the Battle of Messines. It was here Henry was on the front line and was wounded by a bayonet to the eye, and whilst recovering from that injury, he sadly died from a fall. The letters also reveal the connection that he and his brother Roy, back in Australia, had to the community and the work that they'd done to help it. From these letters and these photos, it's obvious that Henry was one of those many soldiers who exemplified the Anzac spirit in their military and their day-to-day lives. Through these letters, I can see the direct ways in which my family can connect to the Anzacs and look to preserve Henry's and the Anzacs' memory. As the official letter of condolence from the Crown says, let those who come after see to it that his name be not forgotten. So how best for me to do this than to continue his legacy and the Anzacs' legacy than through the spirit that so strongly set them apart? But, of course, having an Anzac relative is not a uniquely me thing, and I'm sure that a lot of you here today have Anzac relatives, or relatives that contributed to the war in some capacity in some nation. Through them, you can understand the importance of honouring the sacrifices they've given, and I propose the Anzac spirit so that you can, as the Crown told the families them, see to it that their name be not forgotten. Anzacs could not be the world-renowned force they are today had they exclusively been feats of military greatness. The Anzac spirit elevated the Anzacs from a status of good soldiers to one of good people, and it should be clear now that they did this with distinction. Upham, Apiata, Sanford, Narimu, my great-great-grandfather, your Anzac relations, not only did they serve this little corner of the earth, but they represented it with endurance, with courage, with ingenuity, with good humour, good heartedness, mateship, and with camaraderie. I pray that we will never have to demonstrate our Anzac spirit in a war like these brave men and women did. And I pray that the thousands of lives sacrificed by the Anzacs in the pursuit of a better tomorrow don't get forgotten. Anzac Day is going to have relevance for my entire generation, and it's going to have relevance for every generation that follows. So long as we employ the traits that they exemplified in our lives, we can honour theirs. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. 
know, it's a real privilege to uh, teach in this school, uh, to be about, around young people like Thomas. Uh, there's a lot of hope. In our world, we can see that sometimes it can be a bit hopeless or feel that way. But when you're around young people who can speak like that, who have a vision like that, who can see that they can make a difference by learning from those that have gone before, there's a lot of hope. Thank you, Thomas, for the work you've put into that. We now come to the commemoration. And before I ask you to stand, I'd just like to give you a few instructions. Board Chair, Mrs. Felicity Odlin, and President of the Old Coles, Ms. Meg Black, uh, will read the role of honour from here. After which, the organ will play, and the President of the Ladies' Circle, Mrs. Alison Ballantyne, along with Ms. Meg Black and Mrs. Felicity Williams, will walk from the front of this chapel, holding the wreaths of remembrance. And as they progress to the memorial enclave, I ask you to turn with them, and as they face and lay those wreaths at the memorial enclave, we will then recite the words of Lawrence Binion, which are in your order of service. There will then be a minute's silence, upon which the last post will be played, and then the pipers lament. Please stand. We remember old collegians who have sacrificed their lives for their country. Desmond Henry Accord. William Keith Anderson. John Douglas Appleby. Colin James Ashworth. Francis Stephen Beard. Neville Barker. Dudley Burnham Lake. Barker, Benjamin Andrew Carson, Alistair Grant Cleary, Richard John Maxton Colson, David Clive Crozier, Irvine William Downer, Vernon Alfred Duncar, Philip Selwyn East, Leonard John Fairburn, William George Ferguson, Robert G. Genge, Robert Whitten Glendening, Graham Alexander Gunn, Richard James Henney, Paddy A. Hilson, Henry Lester Hudson, Brian Leslie Francis Hunter, Lindsay David Hutton, Peter Hindman, William Francis Irwin, Edward Isherwood, Frederick John Martin James, Howard Walter James, Bernard Murray Lake, Maurice Richard Langdale Hunt, James Frederick Luthwaite, Charles Jeffrey John Lloyd, Derek Ernest McCartney, Murray Mackenzie, Edward Dunford McGuinness, Barry Martin, Noel Allen Masson, Neil John McNutt, Thomas Henry Middleton, George Ewart Milnes, Henry Allen Moray Smith, William Owen Morris, Gerald Oliphant Morrison, Russell Ernest Orchard, Donald Jeffrey Macmillan Reed, Roderick David Rollo, 
Ian, Armit, Scott. Edwin, Ains, Shand. Joseph, Cunningham, Simpson. Richard, Jeffrey, Smith. Trevor, Adrian, Stowe. Frank, Douglas, Sutherland. Ronald, West, Taylor. Ronald, Luttrell, Temple. Harold, Edward, Vickery. George, Hilary, Bogan. Frank, Derek, Ward. Raymond, Wallace, Watson. Ian, Halliday, Webster. Frank, Edward, Whitaker. Munro, James, Wilson. John, William, Winstone. James, Campbell, Wunal. Robert, Bet, Young. And from the staff? James, Samuel, Cartwright. William, Ernest, Woodbury. Let us say together, they shall not of, as that we shall grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning we will remember them.
You may be seated. Now I invite our Deputy Head Girl, Charlotte Roach, to bring us our final prayer. Thank you, Charlotte. Let us draw near to God in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, you look upon the world and its people with concern and compassion. We are remembering young men who left their work, their farm, their family to go to war. Some had not long left our St Andrews College. We are remembering those who did not return. We are remembering the empty chair at the table. We are remembering the parents, wives, girlfriends and mates who grieved. O oh God, our prayer and plea is for us to never again go to war. But today, war is in our world. Help us settle our disputes by talking and listening. Help us turn swords into plowshares. Help us grow enough food for everyone. Help parents be able to provide for their children. Let there be an end to greed and a new beginning of generosity. Let there be peace, but not peace without justice. O oh God, let peace in the world begin with us. Let us not bully one another, but be alongside one another. Let us not put one another down, but build one another up. Let us not choose violence, but gentleness. Let our homes be safe and happy places for everyone. O oh God, as the Anzacs stood shoulder to shoulder in war, let Australians and New Zealanders stand together in peace, building a fair and caring society in our Pacific Ocean place. O oh God, let everyone know your love for them and have love to give. In the way of Jesus our Lord, Amen. I invite you to stand for our national anthem. Please stand. Just a final comment from me. The writers of the text that were read today were from a tribe that had been on the receiving end of plenty of suffering, hardship from other powerful nations around them. And so they write with a vision of peace. They write with a particular vehemence toward those that would abuse their power and take advantage of people weaker than themselves. And yet this people group, they fail to take heed of their own suffering experiences and they revert to a belief, often a belief in the myth of redemptive violence. A few weeks ago we celebrated the gift of Easter and today we commemorate Anzac Day. Both these events are about laying one's life down for others. 
But one significant difference, one story crushes the myth of redemptive violence. Where war says you bomb us, we'll bomb you. Easter speaks of the cross, where Jesus goes without retaliation. So how do we make a new world? One where violence is no longer in circulation. The Christian worldview believes you go to the cross. A place where the one suffering says, Father, forgive them. When we can no longer hear the cry of our fellow human beings, when we fail to care, when we fail to seek reconciliation, we'll struggle to overcome those that seek to harm us. We'll struggle to grow in unity. We'll struggle for solidarity. Anzac Day is about remembering, and remember, we must. We must remember the cry of the past generations, past suffering and sacrifice, and say enough is enough. Because if we fail to do this, as we see in the world today, we so quickly revert to the mistakes of the past. Our identity can be prideful, confused, and even lost. And we can under struggle to understand why we are as we are. Remembering gives us the encouragement and inspiration to live for a better tomorrow. Remembering brings hope, and not just for us, but for those that will come after us. To the young people of St Andrews College, remember and honour those that have gone before you. For as you do, you will be, have much to be grateful for. You'll be quick into action to support the needs of those around you, to forgive and to reconcile. As a St Andrews College community, we will remember, least we forget. Please stand for the benediction. Kia tau, kia tato kato, te atafai o tau tato ariki a ihu karati. Me te aroha o te atua, me te fifinga taitanga, te wairu a tapu. Ake, 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 ani. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore.